We are here today to discuss uh, the new ESC guidelines on chronic coronary syndromes. And uh, we do have uh, four colleagues that are going to answer some of key questions uh, in these guidelines. The first question is to Professor Ferrari. So, Roberto, what is your opinion on the new ESC guidelines? Oh, well, thanks. My opinion is that these are very good guidelines. They are very comprehensive and very innovative. I particularly like that the guidelines are centered on the patients and there are a lot of recommendations to the patients. What I particularly like of these guidelines is the diagnostic approach, which is a very new and innovative because the guidelines are asking you not to diagnose angina, but to diagnose the reason for angina. And this is important because the guidelines recognize that not all anginas are the same. Some may be due to epicardial stenosis. Other may be due to either epicardial spasm or a spasm on an existing stenosis. But either can be due to microvascular alteration, which again can be due to endothelia dependent, endothelia independent, and so on. So very good that the guidelines are forcing us not to diagnose angina, but to diagnose the reason of angina. And that has uh, an importance because uh, the treatment may change. And uh, obviously the guidelines are comprehensive. They produce a very complicated algorithmic but what they are also telling us, please do a very good anamnesis because you can immediately understand whether your patients might suffer of an epicardial angina and then they will suggest to look at the anatomy of the coronary artery if you suspect, and from the pain, you can realize that if you suspect microvascular angina, you will go more for functional tests and they produce an enormous amount of possibilities, very, very big menu of functional tests. Also for the treatment, of course, uh, uh, Faust, we were generating the diamond approach. And so I'm very glad that they adopted the diamond approach. However, they didn't fully adopt the philosophy of the diamond approach, that all the drugs are equally the same in treating angina. And that is important because according to the diamond, you should never categorize drugs in the first and second line. Also because, ironically, the second line drugs have more scientific data than the first line one. So in that, uh, the diamond approach is an improvement, uh, not complete uh, improvement. And also there are little things in the guidelines, some that I like very much. For instance, the use of uh, ACE inhibitors in uh, patients with microvascular angina, and I suggest uh, always uh, perindopil because of its uh, a good action on the endothelium. And other things that I like less, like, for instance, the use of evabradine only in patients uh, with uh, ejection fraction below 30% without any explanation why that, and also some down regulation, for instance, for trimetazidine without uh, any scientific reason for doing that. But altogether, Fausto, my opinion on the guidelines is that they are millions of times better than the previous one, and uh, as we say, nobody is perfect. And I'm sure that they are really reaching the perfection. Very good guidelines, in my opinion. Uh, Professor Padilla, uh, which is in your practice, how do you treat microvascular angina? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Because the first thing I do in my clinical practice is that I don't wait uh, prescribing symptomatic agents, I, I give them uh, from the start, from the first visit of the patient. And also the treatment in um, microvascular angina, the preferred uh, drug that I use is always a metabolic agent. I prefer combining trimetacetine with a beta blocker. And if the patient uh, persists symptomatic, then I, I add a new one. But I always focus in the 
pathophysiologic aspect of the microvascular angina, which the metabolic agents are the first line treatment. Even the less, the combination of two drugs is better than using one and a stage by stage adding another uh, drug for, for the treatment. And now let's ask our chairman, Professor Pinto, which is his approach to patients with the combination of a microvascular and obstructive angina. Thank you, Roberto. This is a very good question because uh, this represents quite a, a number of patients that we have to deal with daily. And this is where you have first to select the patients who need to undergo revascularization. And you do that through the a strategy of using imaging methods that can help you to identify the patients. And the guidelines are very clear now in terms of a stepwise approach to identify the patients that may benefit from coronary revascularization, even if you have to take that decision at the time of uh, the coronary angiography by using some functional testing like IFR or FFR doing the uh, procedure. So that's the first uh, aspect is to select the patients that may benefit from revascularization because of the existence of epicardial disease. And we have to say that this is mostly for symptom relief since in patients with chronic syndromes, there is no uh, clear evidence that we will have a major impact on patients' outcomes. So it's more for symptom relief of these patients. On the other hand, we do have the pharmacological treatment or the optimal medical treatment that we should optimize in these patients, regardless of being revascularized or not. And this is where you have to have a combination of uh, hemodynamic agents, uh, such as the beta blockers, the uh, calcium channel blockers, AC inhibitors, and so on. And at the same time, to include also metabolic agents, such as trimetazidine. And this is combination has proven to be quite efficient in terms of dealing with the symptoms of the patient. But also we do have some evidence that it may have some impact in patient uh, outcome later on. So this combination of potential need for revascularization and uh, optimal medical treatment is the basis of the treatment of patients uh, who do have this combination of obstructive angina, meaning obstructive coronary artery disease, epicardial disease with uh, uh, microvascular dysfunction. Professor Ray, uh, which drugs would you use to reduce the symptoms in patients uh, with epicardial coronary stenosis? Thank you, Professor Pinto. The main aim of treating chronic coronary syndrome is to relieve the angina because very thin few procedures can reduce the event rate or mess rate. As we know, revascularization is usually done to reduce angina. So the same thing is done by the pharmacotherapy. So if we give adequate pharmacotherapy, we can do away with more than 90% of the angioplasties which are done nowadays, which will be redundant, excepting for a few cases where there is prognostic benefit anticipated. Now the pharmacotherapy should include the hemodynamic agent as well as some metabolic agents, even in epicardial coronary artery disease. The hemodynamic agent is usually chosen on the basis of the patient profile. The beta blocker, the diltiazem verapamil, or evabradine. These are the three important hemodynamic agents which can be used interchangeably depending on the patient's profile. In most cases, because of our long-standing experience, we use beta blocker. But when beta blocker is not uh, tolerated or contraindicated, evabradine is a very good substitute. Even evabradine can be added to beta blocker if we cannot give to the full dose of beta blocker. But evabradine itself is good enough to substitute beta blocker. Of course, diltiazem verapamil should not be uh, combined with evabradine, and it's not given in case of uh, there is heart failure, particularly with systolic reduced ejection fraction. So these are my initial approach of hemodynamic agent, along with nitrate and nicorandyl as and when needed as top up on these three basic hemodynamic agents. And there is microvascular angina element also can be treated with a trimetazidine, which is the best suited drug with the least side effect 
and the ubiquitous use accepting one contraindication that is atrial fibrillation um, or accepting one contraindication which is again being negated that advanced Parkinson's disease but as Professor Ferrari has proved that there is hardly any extra pyramidal symptom even with a long-standing use of ibogradin. So that's open choice and I think patients should be taken into confidence while giving the medicines, explaining the pros and cons of each drug and have a free choice. Uh, chronic uh, coronary syndromes, uh, it's a relatively frequent condition that uh, we have to deal on a daily basis. The new ESC guidelines on chronic coronary syndromes, they do highlight some important aspects in terms of diagnosis, identification of these patients, and also strategies to manage these conditions, either through revascularization or uh, optimal medical treatment. It's included now in the ESC guidelines, uh, a, an approach that was uh, uh, developed uh, by Professor Ferrari, myself and others a few years ago, the so-called diamond approach, which we believe can be more convenient and more efficient in the management of these patients by using a combination of uh, different uh, uh, medical drugs that actually will uh, uh, combine themselves in a way that can actually address uh, the underlying pathophysiology of the mechanisms of myocardial ischemia on the individual patient. So uh, we do have uh, good guidelines with some limitations that uh, we have uh, shown uh, in these uh, presentations, but also that can help us uh, to guide uh, how to do our best to manage uh, our patients uh, with chronic coronary syndromes, which is a condition that is more frequent than many times we realize. And that's why it's so important uh, that we do a good identification of these patients, good diagnosis, and then the best possible management of the condition. Thank you so much for watching this uh, program. I hope you enjoy the expert opinions for the new CCS guidelines from leaders around the world. You may also watch another TMA webinar related to CCS guideline by clicking the web link provided in the description box below. If you have any interesting questions or comments, please post them in the comment box below. The experts will reply and the International Cardiometabolic Channel Secretariat will post their feedback on their behalf. Any adverse events and product quality complaints should be reported to the competent authority or at a Servia web link provided the description box.